Well, good morning, Center Point Church. Thank you for joining us once again on this wonderful Sunday morning. Before we start singing, let's read Psalm 150 together. Aleluya, alabado sea el Señor. Alaben a Dios en su santuario. Alábenlo con su poderoso firmamento. Alábenlo por sus proezas. Alábenlo por su inmensa grandeza. Alábenlo con sonido de trompeta. Alábenlo con el arpa y la lira. Alábenlo con panderos y danzas. Alábenlo con cuerdas y flautas. Alábenlo con címbalos sonoros. Alábenlo con címbalos resonantes. Que todo lo que respira, alabe al Señor. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his acts of power. Praise him for his surpassing greatness. Praise him with the sounding of the trumpet. Praise him with the harp and lyre. Praise him with the tremble and dancing. Praise him with the strings and pipe. Praise him with the clash of cymbals. Praise him with res resounding cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Amen. Let's praise him for his faithfulness this morning.
everyone and welcome to our Southern Point Church online service. I'm Edgar and this is Gina and we are so glad that you have joined us this morning. If you're new, please text CONNECT to the number on the screen. We'd love to hear from you. If you have kids in your family, our amazing pastors Brandon and Hannah have created a wonderful kids service. The video link will be in the description. Tonight, we have an all church meeting at 6 p.m. where we'll talk about details and reopening. So you do not want to miss it. And the Zoom link is in the description. Men, all the men watching right now, there is a men's breakfast this Saturday at 9 a.m. Be on the lookout for an email coming out this week that will include a little more information as well as the Zoom link. Now, as we move on to our time in giving, I think it's always important to talk about why we give. And giving is a way that we worship the Lord. It's a way of worshiping Him and acknowledging that as He has provided for us in our needs, we give back to Him. As He has given to us, we give back to the Lord. If you look to the graphic next to us, there are several ways to give. Please join me while we pray for the offering. Lord, thank you for this day that we have another morning to celebrate uh, life with you and with each other, God. I just ask that your hand is over each of these givers, Lord, that you give them a joyful heart as they give, as well as just multiply this for your kingdom, Lord, and um, just continue to be with us throughout the rest of this week. Amen. Well, let's welcome Pastor Keith as he brings the word for us this morning. Well, good morning, Center Point Church. It's really good to be with you this morning. Thank you for joining us. Last week was an incredible week as we spent time with Mountaintop Church, worshiping with them on the lawn. And we are going to do that again next Sunday. And uh, we just had a great time connecting. Pastor Rob Seguiers and I are just close friends and our families are close. And uh, so it was a great time. It was a great time preaching together with Pastor Rob. <clears throat> and we look forward to doing that again next Sunday. And it's at 10 o'clock on the lawn. And you can see, and you can find information about that in the, uh, in the notes. Now, um, it was interesting that we got to preach to people. It's the first time I think that I've preached to actual people in a long time. And uh, it just reminded me how much I need people uh, to, to speak to. Uh, because right now I'm, I'm speaking to a camera. And of course my daughter Christy is here, but uh, you know, and she's a good amen person, but uh, it's, just, <laughs> it's, just, it's just not quite the same. Uh, so next Sunday, again, we'll be together. And then uh, tonight at six o'clock, we do have a, a, a Centerpoint family Zoom meeting. And uh, you can see the link as well here. But um, please join us if you're part of our church. I want to give you some information about when we can come back together as a church and, and other information as well. And I want to connect with you. So please, uh, please join us for that Zoom call. All right, we have been in Matthew chapter 5. We were talking about the Beatitudes, which is the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 5 through 7, uh, Jesus is giving us the Sermon on the Mount uh, with his disciples and with people, and he starts with what we call the Beatitudes. And these are just brief statements that he makes, and in and of themselves may not make sense, but when you dig deeper into them, you find that they have meaning meaning. And uh, they really are uh, a bunch of paradoxes. And so we're calling the series Paradoxology, really the study of God through the paradoxes found in the Beatitudes. And so that's where we're at. I'd like to just read those one more time for us. Uh, so many times we read past the Beatitudes because they're short and because they're just one sentences. Um, so, and we just kind of get past it too quickly. So I'd, I'd just like to read it, read them to you. Uh, Matthew chapter 5, <clears throat> 1 through 10. Now when he saw the crowds, he went up on the mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Pastor Ashley talked about that uh, two weeks ago. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they will be filled. 
Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Well, we need some peacemakers today, don't we? Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you. Because of me, rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So here we have the Beatitudes as, uh, as written by uh, Matthew. And so uh, I want to take a look at this a little bit because Jesus really is talking about the kingdom of God. So let's, let's do a little contextualization here for a moment. Who was present at this? So we know that Jesus, uh, there were crowds that followed Jesus and he went up to the mountainside and he began to teach people as he looked out over over the people, he had compassion on them, and he knew where they were from. He knew their hearts. And as he's looking out over them, he's talking to his disciples. So we have the crowd there present. We have the disciples that are present, followers of Jesus. We also have, we know through other passages that uh, the religious leaders were also present. The people that he looked over in he was contrasting the people with the religious leaders who were trying to make it harder to be part of the kingdom of God. And uh, so he's looking out over the people. These are people that lived in a constant state of hunger and thirst. Uh, Jesus cared about these people. The people that were there were some were curious. Jesus had taught with authority and he healed the sick. People were curious to see uh, if this Jesus may perhaps be the Messiah that they've heard about. <clears throat> the sick and needy were sh for sure there. People would bring their family members who were sick and bring them to Jesus. We know this, that they were in an environment where, they were, where the people were ruled. They were politically ruled by the Roman government. There was heavy taxation on them. So they were politically, they felt like they were being ruled, and, and they were. Religiously, they were ruled by the Pharisees and Sadducees. There was a class, an upper class religiously, that dictated what it meant to follow God, and they would make up other commandments. Uh, so it would be more difficult to follow God or to know God. Uh, there were people that were praying for a Messiah. The disciples certainly believed that Jesus was the Messiah. They thought maybe he would come and rescue them that day and, uh, and deliver them from the Roman government. So, so the Messiah does come in Jesus Christ. But rather than riding a, a chariot with big fanfare, loudspeakers, and an army, Jesus comes and he sits down among them and he begins to speak healing words to them. He begins to teach them what the kingdom of God looks like. And each of the statement is packed with soul-searching words. And he's, he's talking about the kingdom. And Jesus really brought the kingdom. And really, that's Matthew's emphasis. <clears throat> when he talks about Jesus and, and describes what Jesus did and what Jesus taught and how he lived, Matthew really wants to tell us that about the kingdom of God. And Jesus preaches the kingdom of God. He begins with, repent for the kingdom of God is near. In Matthew chapter 4, just one chapter before what we're studying, the scripture says that Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness among the people. This is not a kingdom with castles and knights and fire-breathing dragons and damsels in distress. Uh, although I'm sure the disciples wanted, wanted Jesus to be that kind of rescuer. They wanted to be set free, and, G and Jesus makes no mention of where that kingdom would be. He doesn't mention a place. Jesus describes what it's like for people to live with a kingdom mindset. When we review scripture, we learn about the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is the rule of God in our hearts and in our lives. 
It's the spiritual realm established in our hearts for every believer. The kingdom of God is about humility, not about pride. The kingdom of God is about serving others rather than being served. The kingdom of God is about loving everyone, not just important people. It's about caring for the want for ones, even people that are different than me. When you are living a, with a kingdom mindset, you love everyone. It's about stewarding the gifts of God rather than hoarding them. And it again, it's about the rule of God in each of our hearts. So we can look at the kingdom of God in very practical ways that has very practical results. It's not some kind of utopia living or ideal. Jesus is saying, you can live like this now. Now, I know that we, Jesus is coming soon, right? He's going to deliver us. He's going to come. The scripture tells us he's going to come riding on a white horse. He's going to, uh, there's going to be a rapture. We're going to be delivered. Jesus will come and reign. <clears throat> All of those things. But sometimes we get so looking forward to Jesus as the great Superman with a cape, and we forget that Jesus wants us to live with a kingdom mindset now. And when we do that, it adjusts everything. And when we, the body of Christ, live with a kingdom mindset, we are giving people a picture of what it means to live in the kingdom serving Jesus Christ. We might say this, we might say that the body of Christ opens the, the doors or the windows of heaven just a little bit for people to get a momentary look into, into the kingdom. That's what the body of Christ should be doing. So we should be leading the way in reconciliation. We should be leading the way in loving our brothers and sisters. That's If we're living with a kingdom mindset, that's how we should live. It changes us. It changes how we live, uh, how we work, and how we uh, how we play, how we engage people, how we love people. It engage. It, it changes how we live with our families. <clears throat> All right. So let's get back to the the first beatitude. We've talked about a couple of those bef a couple of beatitudes uh, already, but let's get to the first one uh, because this, these are value statements that Jesus is giving. And uh, he says this in, in all of the Beatitudes. He says, blessed, he starts with blessed. In other words, um, the, uh, there's a state of happiness or contentment or peace or fulfillment in my life. And so he says, blessed are you. And then he talks about the subjects. So there's the poor in spirit. There, there are those that mourn. There are the meek, the hungry, the merciful, the persecuted, the subjects of the kingdom. Blessed are those. But all of these express something missing. You know, because if you're hungry, there's something missing. If you're meek, there's something missing. If, there's, you know, if you're poor in spirit, there's something missing. And then Jesus finishes each of these statements is with something like, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, or they will be comforted, or they will inherit the earth, or they will be filled, or they will be shown mercy. In other words... You may not want any of these things, but you're about to experience something amazing because you're a follower of Jesus. You're going to experience more of God in these things. And really, I think Jesus is kind of saying your pain, your need, your want, your loss, your brokenness will lead you to experience God and in, in his presence in a profound way. Don't we know that in our times of want, in our times of need, in our times of pain, we can either live in resentment or we can take a, a victim mentality or we can turn to Jesus and grab a hold of him. I've heard it said that uh, by someone, you know, once you reach the end of yourself, you're just beginning to touch the beginning of God. That's, that's what he's describing here. So he says, blessed are the poor in spirit. Not poor financially, but blessed are the poor in spirit. Now there's, there's two words in the Greek, and William Barclay, the commentator, commentator uh, helps us with this. Uh, he says there's, there's two words that talk about, that are used for the word poor. One is the man who, uh, the, who works and has needs, but he's working, he's working with his hands. He's not rich, 
he's, he's still, but he he's in wants, and so he works daily. He gets up and goes to work, and he's provided, and so he provides for his family or himself. Uh, but he's not necessarily rich. So in that, there's a word for that, uh, a word poor. The second word in the Greek that is used here is a word that describes poverty, those who are literally forced to their knees to beg. I remember being in India many years ago and seeing abject poverty. And uh, people were just desperate at that time for anything. And so we would drive by or we would, uh, we would slow down for some reason in a village. And, and people would just beg for, for money, beg for anything. And uh, they would hold up their starving children uh, to, to see if we would be generous to them or give to them in charity. This is, this is what that word describes, that kind of poverty, the desperate. So you could say, blessed are those who are absolutely destitute. Now, the Jews understood uh, poor this way. They, they had a special way of using the word poor, which stems from their understanding, understanding of the Hebrew word, because the poor in the Hebrew had four stages of development. It, it, the meaning was developed. One was, it goes, it goes like this. One, they began by meaning simply poor. Two, they went on to mean, because poor, therefore, having no influence or power or help or prestige, which leads to number three. They went on to mean, because of having no influence, therefore, downtrodden and oppressed. And then number four, finally, they came to describe those, those who, because they have no earthly resources, whatever, Put their whole trust in God. That's where you get uh, things like what the psalmist said. Why so downcast, O my soul? Put your hope in God. Completely, There's a complete dependency on God. So when Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God, that's what he's kind of referring to. If you re have realized... People who are poor in spirit realize their utter helplessness and they must put their hope in God. So and you might say it this way, then the New Living Translation says, God blesses those who are poor and realize their need for him for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. The Message Translation says it this way, you're blessed when you're at the end of your rope. With less of you, there is more of God and his rule. I think to help us understand this a little bit, uh, there are several passages that I want to just refer to. One is found in Luke chapter 18. Jesus is teaching. And, uh, and he's trying to help people understand what it means to come before God and be poor in spirit. And um, he says this to the Pharisees. He said, to some who were confident in their own righteousness and looked down on everybody else, Jesus tells this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood up and prayed about himself. God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breasts and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Jesus goes on to say, I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Jesus offers this parable to help us understand what it means to come before God with a humble heart, or going back to Matthew, the poor in spirit look like this. I was also reminded of uh, two churches in the book of Revelation. And uh, I want to read a couple of passages, and we can contrast two churches. In verse 7, of chapter 2, he's talking to the church at Smyrna. 
And let me read this. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give the right to eat of the tree of life, which is in paradise, in the paradise of God. <clears throat> to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, these are the words of him who is the first and the last who died and came to life again. I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you are rich. I know your poverty, yet you, in my eyes, are rich. So when we feel like we are in want, we have need, we don't have hope, but we're followers of Jesus Christ, Jesus says, you are rich in me. In your weakness, that's where my strength excels. <clears throat> Contrast that with... <clears throat> In chapter 3, the church in Laodicea, hear the words. These are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds, that you are neither hot nor cold. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. Wait, that's powerful words there, right? Listen to this. You say... I am rich. I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so that you can become rich and white clothes to wear so, uh, so you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so you can see. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. And he just goes on. So you have two churches, one in Smyrna who, who are poor. And Jesus says, you are rich. And you have the church in Laodicea. And they think they have everything. And yet Jesus said, you are poor. You are in need. You, you do not have what you think you have. And I think that really speaks to us today. We have to lay down our pride when we think that we have everything in God, that we, that we don't have need of him, then we're in trouble. Jesus says to us, you are poor. But to those of us who come before God and with a humble heart, he says, you are rich. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. For they get to experience kingdom-like living and a kingdom heart mentality. So what's the application here? <clears throat> First application is that if we are to come before God, we must come with humility. To truly experience this spiritual poverty, we must come before the Lord with broken and humble hearts, empty of pride and conscious of the debt we owe for our sin. Blessed are the poor in spirit. And it includes an honest confession that we are sinful and utterly without moral virtues and that we need <clears throat> to come to God. It's so uh, amazing to watch someone who recognizes that they are in need of God. When someone comes to the end of them, themselves and they realize that they've been trying to do this thing without God, and they've been living a life <clears throat> that they know doesn't please God. <clears throat> and when they humbly come before God and turn to him, they recognize that they cannot save themselves, that only God can save. How, how does one boast in the presence of God? I like what Max Lucado says in the, in the book, The Applause of Heaven. He says, you don't impress the officials of NASA with a paper airplane. <laughs> you don't boast about your crayon sketches in the presence of Picasso. And you don't claim uh, equality with Einstein because you can write H2O. And you don't boast about your goodness in the presence of the perfect. Wow. How much goodness can we bring to God? You know, how, how good do you have to be to get to God? We must humble ourselves before him. 
James chapter 4 tells us, <clears throat> Submit yourselves then to God and resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve and mourn and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. When we realize, God, I got nothing, that I'm completely dependent on you. I'm coming before you, O oh Lord, and submitting myself to you. That's humility. And then there's repentance. Lord, I, I surrender. Repentance is an act of surrender. And there's this humility, and then there's repentance, and then there's this surrender. And then there's the receiving of grace. For yours is the kingdom of God. That's the grace of God extended to each of us. There's where we experience the goodness of God and his grace, when we humble ourselves before him. You can't earn grace, but you receive grace. I'd like to close our moment with, uh, with the Lord's Prayer. I'd like to read it slowly to you because I, I believe it kind of sets us up in a prayer of, of kingdom thinking. And so would you just bow your heads with me? And I just want to pray through the Lord's Prayer slowly. And, uh, and just let this speak to us together as we humble our hearts before the Lord. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Holy is your name. You are holy and you are worthy. And we come before you. You are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Oh Lord, in this moment right now, we need your will to be done in our lives, in our families, in our churches, in our country. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Give us this day our daily bread. And Lord, we need every day. We need to hear from you and we need to receive from you spiritual sustenance along with physical provision. We recognize our need for you. We are in want and you are our provider. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Forgive us our debts. The times in which we have failed. The times where we have not represented the kingdom of God very well. Lord, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. In this moment where there's so much anger, where we do not necessarily agree with everyone, Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And here's the doxology. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Hey, I want us to take a moment today. And as the music just plays for a little bit, I'd like for you to engage. Engage with the message, engage with each other online. Just, uh, I know on Facebook there's a comment section, and on YouTube there's a comment section. Just engage, maybe give one sentence of praise to God. Or maybe write out a short prayer. Maybe you're praying for something. Maybe you're in need or want, and, and you're desperate for something. Just write that out. Let's engage with one another. And then maybe for some of you, it will be to write a confession before God. You've tried it yourself. You've tried everything you can do. And now you need to confess and come before the Lord with, hum with a humble heart. You may recognize today that you are the one that is poor in spirit. I want you to know that there's hope for you because as Jesus looked out over the crowd and he looks into your life, and he says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for yours 
is the kingdom of heaven because that's where I am. And where I am, there is peace and there is joy and there's abundant life in me. That's what Jesus would say to me. Pray that you would give your heart to Jesus. I pray that you would live for Jesus with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. If there's a way that we can connect with you, please let us know. Email us at info at centerpointchurch.com. We'd love to connect with you. We'd love to pray for you. Let's, let's love Jesus with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. God bless you. Have a wonderful, wonderful week. And we will see you tonight. Thank you, worship team, for leading us in worship. And thank you, Pastor Keith, for the impactful message. I just encourage each of you to continue to reflect, to discuss with one another what God has been teaching you throughout this series. If you have any prayer requests, shoot us an email at info at .com. We love seeing your prayer requests, and we pray for each and every one of you as a staff every week. You know what I'm excited for? What? That I get to see each of you at 6 p.m. Have, have a, a great, great week. week.